When did recreational fishing begin in the United States? And say more specifically, when did it begin in Michigan? Well, there was recreational fishing in, in the United States in the 18th century, uh, although very little has been written about it. Um, there has been some writings about even George Washington, the president, uh, engaging in recreational fishing. So it did occur in the 18th century. However, the first real fishing books, so to speak, about that activity in the United States occurred in the early part of the uh, 19th century. What is generally recognized as the first book, indeed, was entitled Natural History of the Fishes of Massachusetts, Embracing a Practical Essay on Angling by a chap named Jerome Smith, in M.D., and this was written in 1833. In like fashion, the first Michigan writings appeared a few years later in the 1840s. I'm thinking about Huck Finn right now. It almost seemed like uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> if you went fishing, it was just kind of an immoral thing to do. You were shirking responsibilities or something. Mm-hmm. But uh, it gained some legitimacy, obviously, in the latter part of the 19th century. And I think part of that had to do with, uh, it must have been the interest in uh, fishing that some of these writers that you were talking about mm-hmm. earlier brought about. So who were the, the writers who first promoted fishing in, in Michigan? Well, you're correct about your observation about the legitimate nature of fishing. And indeed, as a, as a corollary to that, you find that many of the early writings about fishing in the United States and in Michigan uh, appeared under pseudonyms, <laughs> that uh, authors did not identify themselves. Indeed, the first American, uh, really American edition of The Complete Angler by Isaac Walton was um, was written by a man named Reverend Bethune, who did not use his real name uh, uh, for a couple reasons, perhaps, but mainly being a reverend, why would a minister of the cloth be writing a, an angling book or be writing on an angling book? And um, uh, But that was a general practice throughout magazines and books of that era. But the writers in Michigan who first promoted fishing in their writings was particularly, uh, should, one in particular should be identified was Charles Landman. He was a um, resident of Monroe, Michigan and initially. He later moved to Cincinnati and then spent most of his life in Washington, D.C. But while he was a native of Michigan, while he resided in Michigan, he started writing about basically um, his sporting tourism that, that and he started publishing, publishing these books in the 1840s. One of his first books was titled Essay for Summer Hours in 1842, and he published Summer in the Wilderness in 1847, and, and basically both of these books were about um, his activities, fishing and, and being a tourist, followed by many other books, and he wrote um, Adventures in the Wilds of North America in 1854, and uh, these were just uh, two or three of the, his most important works uh, that related to angling. Uh, others included um, Robert B. Roosevelt wrote about Michigan. Uh, he was the, as I mentioned earlier, he was the uncle of Theodore Roosevelt and he wrote in 1865 a book titled Superior Fishing that included a great amount of material from Lake Superior and um, and there were many other earlier accounts but they tended to focus not on sport fishing as much as they focused on uh, reports of Native Americans and how they fished in the Sioux Rapids or in Saginaw Bay through the ice, for example. But uh, there were many writings of that uh, genre. Charles Landman writings were all almost all descriptions from a tourist perspective. One of his books was even titled How Ho Nu, Records of a Tourist, written in 1850, in which he talked about some of his angling experiences. Um, Many, many other books, uh, including the works by Brown and by Norris, for example, that I alluded to earlier, uh, often included chapters on where to go and gave a sort of a geographical representation of, of how to go fishing. And after the Civil War, improvement in transportation networks, steamships, and Michigan railroads brought these um, opportunities to the more and more to the common man. But uh, there were many, many books authored on where to go and how to go about it, where to stay, <laughs> how to get there. Uh, they became uh, tourism manuals in many ways for the sportsman tourist. So was it really a, I mean, you mentioned the common man, but was it more of a sport that uh, 
the leisure classes could afford. There's no doubt about it that uh, that people referred to the latter part of the 19th century as the Gilded Age, and, and uh, <laughs> indeed, um, most of the uh, the individuals who participated in recreational fishing in the United States were fairly well-to-do individuals. Uh, most of the common class, the more common class, uh, their ties to, to sport fishing was mainly getting food for the table. And so as the century passed and the economic uh, status of individuals improved throughout the Industrial Revolution, more and more of these individuals could pursue this uh, activity as a form of recreation or leisure activity as opposed to one that put bread and food on the table. So uh, you see this transition in the writings and the authors, the, um, uh, the, the writings and the periodicals especially and in the books you see are, are all written by individuals who are fairly well off in an economic sense. And, and as you approach the turn of the century, you find more and more individuals who are the man on the street is able to go fishing in a recreational way. A lot of this seems to have taken place after the Civil War. Economically, people were far better off. I think it was also a period of great healing, mm -hmm. and people wanted to focus on something other than the, the terrible uh, atrocities associated with that war. Uh, I think that there's the... Um, the information age was, was upon the populace at that time as well. The, if you look at the just the numbers of periodicals written specifically for sporting topics, you see an explosion of growth after 1870. And, and that um, there were many, many uh, books and articles written for the populace uh, after that period of time. And so the information allowed individuals to pursue their, their, uh, their leisure time activities. So that was another reason, in addition to transportation, why uh, you saw more and more of this happening after the Civil War. People were economically better off. They, had, they wanted to focus on something other than war and, and strife. It, it uh, improved their intellectual well-being, their physical well-being, as Walton pointed out. <laughs> and so why not? <laughs> Okay, to follow up on that, then uh, what would it have been like for someone, say, some ambitious young fly fisherman from New York City uh, to travel to northern Michigan? Essentially, it, starting in the 1860s, starting in the 1860s and uh, continuing on to the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, there was an enormous growth in the first in the Great Lakes of the steamship trip networks, that is, Prior to 1860 and 1870 especially, one could migrate to various places along the Great Lakes by uh, steamship and, and visit streams and, and uh, Great Lakes areas using that mode of transportation. And then in, as the 1870s, 80s, and 90s approached, you had an increasing use of railroads to, um, to be able to go from the population centers in the lower Michigan up to the uh, upper part of the state and also into the upper peninsula. Individuals migrated from using boats as a means of transportation to primarily railroads as their means of getting to the upper part of the lower peninsula and also into the upper peninsula of Michigan. And this is true throughout the United States. Railroads progressed throughout the country. And while there were numerous railroads in Michigan, uh, during the latter part of the 19th century, at least three or four railroads began to dominate the market for traffic that was going to be from the southern populated part of the state to the northern tier of the state and even into the Upper Peninsula. Uh, first, the Michigan Central Railroad ran sort of up through the middle of the state, up through uh, the Bay City and up through Grayling on up to the Straits, um, while the Pier Marquette Railroad, which formed from an amalgamation of several railroads in 1899, tended to run up along the western shore of, of Michigan, along Lake Michigan shoreline, up to Traverse City and ultimately to Petoskey. And then the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad uh, began from Cincinnati and Fort Wayne and continued on up to the, through the western portion of the state, not the shoreline, but the western portion of the state, to Traverse City, ultimately, Charlevoix and Petoskey and the Straits. Um, and finally, a smaller railroad, uh, the Detroit Mackinac Railroad, had lines that followed the Lake Huron shoreline to the Sheboygan area. So all of these railroads served the sportsmen. Indeed, all of these railroads published uh, brochures focused on just the sportsmen. The Clark Library, I believe, has a number of uh, maps of these early roads going up through Michigan. 
Yes, the, the Clark Historical Library holds many, many rare maps that reflect the growth of railroads in Michigan. Uh, however, two maps in particular are very uncommon. One map shows the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad and its lands that are available for purchase for future land settlement by farmers or for uh, homesteaders. Another map from the Flint and Marquette, Pier Marquette Railroad um, shows its development in the late 1860s. So these are examples of very uncommon maps, very large and full of historical information. They're both very rare. In addition, the many railroad brochures in the Clark Collection show timetables and individual maps for the respective lines. One very special map published by the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad in, in 1879 and then published again in 1880 shows an imprint of a grayling fish superimposed upon the map and then later in the in 1879 published uh, the same map with a brook trout superimposed upon a map of the railroad line. I might add that the the holdings of the Clark Historical Library of both the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad and Pier Marquette Railroad items that are related to angling are certainly the most outstanding to be found anywhere. They're very very impressive uh, materials. The GRNI Railroad advertising itself as early as, as uh, 1876 as the fishing line. I think they saw this as a marketing opportunity to, uh, to increase their revenue sources. But starting in 1876, they published um, uh, booklets aimed at the fishermen, or eight, actually 1875, pardon me, they started publishing booklets aimed at the sportsmen. And essentially they published books annually thereafter up until approximately 1916. Uh, by 1890, the GRNI even adopted a jumping trout as a logo for the railroad. So there's no doubt that the, it identified itself and aligned itself very much with the sportsman uh, throughout its uh, history. Is, is that the only way that they uh, promoted themselves or through brochures and that sort of thing? Or? Well, in addition to the, the brochures and the logo, uh, they, they increasingly catered to just the tourists, the, the non-sportsman tourists. That is, they, they were very much uh, interested in promoting the bucolic nature of, of resorts and hotels located in places like Charlevoix, Petoskey, Harbor Springs, Mackinac Island, as places where one should go in summer and uh, get away from the bugs and get away from the heat of the oppressive uh, southern part of Michigan. And so in addition to the sportsman brochures, they annually would publish brochures dated to the summer, uh, focused on the summer tourist. And indeed in 1886, the GRNI, together with the Michigan Central Railroad and I think uh, Detroit Transportation Company, built the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island, which exists today for the same reasons. So the G, the, G, uh, the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad was involved in that? It was yeah. one of the partners that built that hotel, yeah. yes. Interesting. Thaddeus Norris, uh, I've already mentioned him, um, took a combination of trains during successive trips in 1874, 1875, and 1876 from Philadelphia in order to fish the Osable and Manassee rivers in Michigan. Now, I know you've got a real interest in the grayling. <laughs> mm -hmm. So was that, uh, was Thaddeus Norris fishing grayling when he went up to the Osable, and mm. was it plentiful at that time? And I know there, there are no longer any grayling in Michigan, is that That's true? correct. Yeah. The, the, the grayling fish is now extinct in Michigan and became so in the Lower Peninsula approximately around the turn of the century. but. In the time period we're talking about, that is from about 1870 to 1900, it was one of the draws of tourists to Michigan. It was one of the attractions that pulled sportsmen to the state of Michigan. And um, literally sportsmen came by the thousands to seek this fish out because it was one of the very few places in the United States that you could fish for grayling. And Norris specifically came on during those three years, 1874, 75, and 76, particularly the fish for the grayling. And indeed, the, the last trip was perhaps, perhaps his most arduous. He uh, essentially uh, entered the upper Manistee River, and they literally had to chop their way downstream, <laughs> cutting down uh, fallen logs and trees. And uh, the trip uh, was so hard on him, and I don't want to say he died because of that trip, but certainly his health suffered thereafter. How old was he at the time? 
I think he was around uh, 75 years oh, old or they're about 76 years old. And he actually died in 1877. But uh, his obituary indicated that uh, his, the last year of his life, he, he, he suffered uh, a great deal from his ailments. He probably should have taken the train. I, <laughs> which <laughs> oh, he did take the train. He, 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 he it took him uh, it took him uh, approximately 48 hours to go from Philadelphia to reach Streamside near Man Mancelona, Michigan. So was that a rough ride to take a train like that? I mean, how comfortable were they? They tried to make things comfortable for you on the GR and I. Well, I think in 1875 is a is a fairly rough ride and. Um, Certainly for Thaddeus Norris, uh, it's, it's hard to imagine in this, in this era of airplane transportation how difficult it might have been. But um, as the time passed in the 19th century, it became increasingly pleasant. And by their standards, by the standards of the 1880s, 1890s, it became increasingly possible to take uh, trains in a more leisure, leisurely fashion. Indeed, um, by the latter part of the 19th century, uh, one could hop on a train in Chicago or Cincinnati or Detroit in, on one day and wake up the next morning sometime on the Straits of Mackinac. Mm -hmm. And so the Pullman cars, the overnight accommodations became increasingly uh, more comfortable. And um, by modern standards, I'm sure they weren't quite there, but uh, nonetheless, at the time, they were deemed quite acceptable and they were much more efficient. So from just that period, from roughly 1870 to 1900, they became increasingly efficient. And um, So when they're, when they're traveling up to the Straits of Mackinac, yes. where are they fishing? Are they fishing in the rivers going in, in the lower peninsula? Is that what they're after? Or yes. Are they crossing the Straits to the upper peninsula ever? Yes, the if you it depends on the railroad that you're you're talking about for, for the Michigan Central Railroad in particular. Typically, the anglers would get off at the town of Grayling and uh, fish the Osable River or the Manistee River. Okay. Uh, or they might continue on up to the Straits and do lake fishing for lake trout okay. uh, or some other um, maybe whitefish in that area. Or they might even go on to the Upper Peninsula later on and and board trains there and head for head for the Sioux even. For the latter part of the 19th century, one could take a train in Chicago up through Wisconsin and okay. ultimately reach Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan. Okay. Uh, that became increasingly a way to go. The other railroads, um, the um, Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad, I've already mentioned the Hersey River is one of the prime grailing streams, but uh, by using the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad, you could fish parts of the of the Little Manistee, Pier Marquette, the uh, uh, Big Manistee Rivers, and then some smaller streams up by the Boardman River, Traverse City, and up streams up near Petoskey. In like fashion, the Pier Marquette Railroad took you a little bit closer to the shoreline of Lake Michigan and gave you more opportunity for lake fishing and, um, and just basically many of the same streams but closer to Lake Michigan. So they were all competing against one another and all extolling the virtues of their respective lines. But uh, uh, there's no doubt that all three railroads um, afforded the opportunity to um, catch grayling and then later on trout and um, also go to the various resorts. If I had the opportunity, I think I'd like to uh, <laughs> take a ride on the GRNI. Is that possible now or is it Oh, gone? no. <laughs> it's, it's long gone. The, uh, as a matter of fact, if you drive towards Grand Rapids today from Mount Pleasant, you, you can, over near Howard City and various other points, you can drive over what used to be the track bed for the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad. And I don't honestly know if there are anywhere along in the lines there are still tracks. I think I think some of their original tracks still exist up in uh, Mackinac City, or, or uh, I should say the Sioux. Um, or no, Mackinac City area is where some tracks still exist. but. Most of it's been pulled up. Most of it's now rails to trails, or yeah, or been has been abandoned. But um, it um, it well, no longer is in existence. What what really brought on its decline? Uh, bad, in short, bad financial model, bad economic planning. Um, the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railroad was poorly funded from the start. It um, initiated from a small town comparatively speaking to other larger cities in the United States and so despite the large funds that it received from the United States government and the state of Michigan for land grants um, it was poorly poorly funded at the outset and um, 
Gradually, as you look at its history, it became increasingly indebted to the Pennsylvania Railroad. It borrowed money over, the, over years and years to keep itself afloat, and gradually it, it became indebted, and finally it changed its name, and after it changed its name to the Grand Rapids and Indiana Railway, as opposed to Railroad, for example. Okay. And, um, and then by, I think, 1920, I, I don't know the exact date, it was um, basically taken over completely by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, the other thing that went on is that starting around 1916, 1915, certainly by 1920, um, not only were the other railroads competitors for the GRNI, but cars became increasingly competition. As individuals became increasingly independent of railroads, getting their own automobile as roads improved throughout the state of Michigan, rather than trying to catch a train to go fishing up north, one could just hop in their car and go fishing up north. So roughly by 1916, 1920, when the railroad uh, went out of business, um, its, its share of the market had fallen. And then by 1950, going fast forward to the present, uh, I think all virtually all north, south north railroads in the state of Michigan had expired. They no longer ran. I, I can't tell you the exact date, but I believe the Michigan Central might have been the last railroad to run to the Straits of Mackinac, and that would have been in the early 1950s, I believe, that it, it stopped running. So the rise and decline of uh, the GRNI Railroad in many ways reflects the cultural changes that were taking place in the state. Would you say that's, I mean, that's obviously true, right? Well, that's, I think that's exactly true. The, I think the GRNI uh, marketed itself, uh, as, you, as we've talked about earlier, to the sportsmen. They marketed itself to the um, tourist, the individual who just was going up to a resort or a hotel and, and, and spend time in the beaches of Lake Michigan or, or Mackinac Island. So over this period of time, you saw the change of this activity being associated with just the wealthy, the Gilded Age, and increasingly an activity of the common man, the individual who could find the resources to uh, make those trips. And, and they found expression in using the GRNI and the Michigan Central and the Pierre Marquette Railroads to go north. They had more free time to pursue these leisure pursuits. And so we saw in general this activity um, associated with um, other cultural events that were going along at the same time. For example, um, in the 1890s, late 1880s, people became more interested in bicycles as another recreational pursuit. They had more leisure time, they could afford to to buy this expensive equipment, and it became more associated with the common man. But I think the GRNI also exemplified what Michigan state motto today suggests, which is, if you seek a pleasant peninsula, look about you. <laughs> and the railroad in the state provided ample opportunity to enjoy the outdoors in the latter 19th century, early 20th century. And even today, we find that pure Michigan <laughs> symbolizes much of the same initiatives. Well, I'd like to thank you, Bob, for taking the time to talk to us about uh, these collections and about the railroad. And I'm sure that this will uh, help to stir an interest in the great collections we have here at the Clark. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I enjoyed it. <laughs>